So should we keep a running tally of all the things that were in season five? Oh gosh, if we did. I mean, there's already been a few people talking about that, uh, but gosh, just the uh, the number of things in there. The I, I don't I, I don't have a thing set up to keep a tally. I'm pretty sure someone listening to this will do a tally of all the things that were either predicted, referenced, or just copied off of season five. You know. It, it, it's it's the way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, having a fan base is a heavy psychological burden, but one of the perks is that people will remember your bullshit garbage, and then you can <laughs> ask them. Um, <laughs> so they have released uh, the new spell jammer, uh, fifth edition. Uh, I don't know what you call it, supplement. Is that what yeah? That, what this product I, I, just called. I would call it a supplement in three parts. Um, this is evocative of prior editions when they would release a campaign setting in multiple books. Though the way they did it this time is weird because it's in three books, but sold as one package, at least for the time being. Um, yeah, the box I have says Spelljammer Adventures in Space. And then inside that box, there are three 64 page books. You pointed out right before I hit record, they all are exactly <laughs> the same length, which I did not notice. That is, uh, it, it's pretty wild. It's like, yeah, three 64 page books. You have the Astral Adventurer's Guide, which is basically the player slash GM settings guide. You have Boo's Astral Menagerie, which is, well, the 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 monsters manual effectively of spell jammer and then finally the light of uh zaris I, I this is going to be a point of contention because uh, dnd dnd always has a lot of gobbledygook yep. but the gobbledygook quotient in spell jammer is much higher so i'm going to say zarsis i know that's wrong but also what are you going to do are you going to exactly. call the cops are they going to oh, shoot me no well you have I no mean, power that the they they already bring up like that type of issue with their section about the the gif, but we'll get there. <laughs> when, oh yeah, we'll get there. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's why if you've listened to my show for a long time, you know I I tend to have characters who are just named like Bob and George and mm -hmm. Ruth or whatever. Like I'm not I'm not really fucking around with a uh, Bruno or Battlehammer. Uh, if that's what you want to do, if you want your setting to be Menzo Ben Zaraban, uh, I can't stop you. But that's mm -hmm. just never been how I've I've, I've approached this hobby. Um, so we can start with the first book alphabetically, I think. Uh, also, welcome to this Dice Funk supplement. Uh, I don't <laughs> know how we're going to release this. It feels though like we have a responsibility uh, as a D and D. Uh, kind of product-based thing to talk about these books. So I decided to record something with Sketch, the most knowledgeable person in our orbit. Uh, so that's what's happening. That's what you're listening to. You probably figured it out from context clues. Possibly, yeah. Uh, yeah, I appreciate being on board for this. As someone who's like you know knowledgeable of rules and some history, I'm not as much like knowledgeable of lore and setting stuff. So it's always kind of interesting to dive into this and. Be like, oh, wow, some of the stuff that was sort of, sort of thrown around in Markov is not really that far off brand, <laughs> given how Spelljammer is. So, yeah, let's just yeah, uh, to prepare for season five Markov of, of, of the show you're listening to. I re went back and read all the old Spelljammer books from mm -hmm. the late 80s, early 90s and stuff, I believe. 88, 89. Yeah. Um, and so a lot of that stuff was just directly from the source. It might have sounded uh, silly. Uh, with the, with the grand exception of the uh, the species I made up, I don't know if we want to talk about that. But a lot of people think that's a spell jammer thing. Uh, mm. It's it's not, <laughs> but we we can get there. Yeah. Um. So to open up this book, the first thing I want to note: every one of these D and D books uh, has a little disclaimer that's unique to the book. The first one here is disclaimer: space sickness is a common malady that primarily affects world huggers. I like that term as <laughs> non non space people. Before embarking on a wild space voyage, consult your local apothecary for a suitable remedy such as a box of crackers, a perfume-soaked handkerchief, or a mop. So we're starting with a joke about vomiting. Off to a great start. Mm -hmm. um, 
I guess the, the thing I want to start with besides that is the art. We have a Nautiloid on the cover here. This is the ship. It's also like the first thing you see in uh, season five of our show. I guess that there's a fight with the Niyogi and then they retreat to the ship and then there's a Nautiloid that chases them. Right, uh, right, right. It's kind of like the that big encounter. Uh, I, I like the Nautiloid. It's also very prominent in the upcoming video game, Baldur's Gate 3. That's an early yeah. access right now. Yeah, and I think it actually opens on like a Nautiloid type shit. I actually remember playing like an early version of the of the game before they started already making it play less like vanilla 5th edition in order to make it a more tolerable video game. Uh, it's a... <laughs> uh, Josh Sawyer specifically brought up some commentary about that by the time they started making modifications. Um, and so it's, it's, it was always interesting seeing that. But yeah, like it, it's it's fun seeing this particular vessel because it's so iconic to Spelljammer. And honestly, it pairs well with Baldur's Gate as an entity as well. So it's a big time for Nautiloids. Actually, the recent Magic the Gathering set, uh, Battle for Baldur's Gate, contained a card of the Nautiloid. Mm. It's a vehicle. It exiles your opponent's graveyard, and then you can bap them with it. It's uh, not very well played, but I think it's a cool card in theory. Next art I want to draw attention to on the contents page here is a Kendori. Uh, mm. These actually show up in Season 6. There's a part where we have a race. Uh, basically uh, a, a little uh, like a NASCAR race on animals. And the <laughs> Lauren's character, I believe, uh, was on a, a baby Kendori, these flying whales. So yeah. not a season five thing, but um, I have used Kendori before. That's like a first, that's the first obscure pull, I would say, of, of this episode we're going to get into. But um, is there anything you want to talk about with these opening pages? Because a lot of it is like um, lore and terms. I, w- I would call it like nerd shit. Yeah, pretty much. Like, cause like once you get into the introduction, it goes straight into explaining like what the wild space is, the wild space system. It goes into explicit detail about how the astral sea is a void, but you can breathe normally and exist indefinitely, never aging and such like that. Um, so it's just like it's one of those things that sort of like explains well, how the heck could people breathe in space? If they're like, well, it's not space; it's the astral sea. You see, one big change you'll notice here is that they do not, and correct me if I'm wrong, use the term phlogiston, which Mm. is an ancient Greek concept of this kind of flammable air stuff that you will see in some spelljammer material. It's like the stuff uh, that is out there, um, and you can like set it on fire and stuff. I'm going to put a link to Phlogiston, P-H-L-O-G-I-S-T-O-N, mm. for you out there. That's one of the things, if you listen to season five, I say, like, Wilson, there's some stuff in Spelljammer called Phlogiston and uh, air envelopes and gravity planes, and, like, we're not going to worry about that because it's, like, too much to keep in your head if you're listening to a podcast. It's fine if you want to use it, but, like, for me, that was more than I wanted to keep uh, people thinking about. But, yeah, this opens yeah. up with wild space, astral sea, astral plane, mm-hmm. all those kind of terms. Yeah, like... Like, yeah, there's, I don't think there's any reference to Flogston at all. I mean, heck, you can even just search D&D Beyond for the term, and it just returns nothing. So ah. I have a feeling that they've scrubbed that out of Spelljammer. Um, so, eh, they're cowards, all right? They, they, they want to embrace <laughs> the fire. <laughs> um, but yeah, do you, what do you think about all of this stuff? Do you, like, if you were sitting down to play Spelljammer, would you make everyone understand... Uh, gravity planes and air envelopes and so forth. I mean, like, there's definitely some cool potential in there, and I believe you're going to want to make sure people are on boarded with that stuff if you're going to go into, like, the built-in campaign, since some of the way stuff works is predicated on that. But, like, gosh, like, it, it's... It, there's so there's a lot in there to take anything for someone at first, and I think you can just focus on like the spell jamming helm and like how spell jamming itself works to get started. Um, uh, that's sort of why just, I would, just yeah. from googling, I found that there is a spell jammer wiki which has its own page for Flogiston. Um, I, I have to say, I, I got all my spell jammer materials, the old stuff from Drive Through RPG. Mm, uh, right, right. Know. If there's a better place, but that's if I have to uh, give credit to someone for helping me find all that old material. I went to physical stores to see if I could find it, and not surprisingly, they do not have that old shit. I I believe that Wizards actually went through and released pretty much every book 
prior to 5th edition in PDF form on drive through RPG. I believe that's what they did. Um, so you can get, like, legal PDFs of pretty much everything except for 5th edition stuff, which, you know, fair enough, that's their business model. But yeah, it, sure. that would track as, like, the way to research OG Spelljammer. Um, yeah, to get our year straight, uh, the original Spelljammer's Adventures in Space box set was released in 89. I said 88 or 89, I believe. And then mm -hmm. there was a 3rd edition, it looks like, here, uh, material. Uh, hmm. It says Paizo published a spell jammer, blah, blah, yep. blah. I guess that was under the D20 system. That was not official. Well, it, it's it's part of the OGL thing. Paizo Publishing was related to like the Dragon Magazine side of things before they split off and made Pathfinder. And so like hmm. you can think of them as like one of the bigger third party entities back in that time frame. And so anyone could release, you know, SRD OGL stuff back then. And as long as Wizards was oh, oh well there was TR um uh shoot <laughs> uh TSR or our, our Wizards you know um as long as they didn't like throw out a cease and desist or otherwise you know I think there was no nothing stopping someone from making a spell jammer book and it was clear that Wizards directly was not as interested in that as they were in like Dark Sun or Eberron Eberron was the big third edition setting that came about. <laughs> But uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm reading here. Apparently, third and fourth had references. Specifically, the Niyogi would show up occasionally. Yes. But this is really the big triumphant. This is the first time they've put out a major product, it looks like, since, uh, you know, on my lifetime. <laughs> I was born in 1990. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, like a year or so ago, they did an April Fool Fool's joke alluding to them releasing a Spelljammer book, which landed as expected as an April Fool's joke for a long sort of like upheld campaign setting and reference material so you know it's finally out which is great and there's certainly a lot of fan servicing going on in here from what i've been able to glean along with some you know some some fun stuff so but yeah uh flogiston man that is that is some stuff that is not in this one you don't have to worry about it you could breathe in space and fly with your yeah. own mind powers yeah, uh, we can probably get back to the lore, but let's uh, 12 minutes in by my reckoning. Chapter one, mm -hmm. character options. Uh, so they don't have any new classes, but they do have backgrounds and races. Um, yes. Surprised that they're still using the term races. I thought they were going to move away from well, that. But. Yeah, and there's already been like some murmurings of what they might do down the line. You know, some people have been, you know, calling for like the term like ancestry or lineage since they've used the term custom lineage already. So mm -hmm. who who knows? We'll see where they go there. But yeah, like the one thing I'll note mechanically is that these backgrounds, I believe, are among our, you know, among the relatively small collection of backgrounds that have a feat packaged with them when you pick them up. Um with the Astral Drifter giving you the Magic Initiate feat for Cleric, and Wild Spacer giving you the Tough feat. Um, but outside of those two backgrounds, the only other character, op character options are, well, these racial options. I think it's uh, interesting to note that the feats are being packaged, because uh, a thing about feats is that they were more integral to the game prior to 5th edition, mm -hmm. when they were implemented as mostly an optional alternative to ability score improvements. Yes. Um... And the early information we have about one D and D, the successor to fifth edition, or the continuation, depending on how you want to think about that a branding exercise. Uh, one of the small bits of information we have is that they are making feats more prominent and important. Uh, mm -hmm. That's kind of one of the big teases. I don't know if we wanted to go too deep into one D and D because we have very little, and presumably we can do a, a bonus pod <laughs> when that gets you know released more. But right, I, I will say that. The feats being optional was, if I'm not mistaken, because I played a lot during the playtest phase of D&D Next, it was sort of codified as sort of part of their language when 5th edition was being made of being backwards compatible with all prior editions of D&D. And in order to make it more like 1 and 2, feats didn't exist in those editions, so feats were like an optional thing, but... Ability score advancements are built in, and technically multi-classing is an optional rule as well. But th uh, that being said, they were always very careful about handing out feats, like you alluded to, until I think the Strixhaven book came out. I think that was the first one where they gave out feats as part of backgrounds. 
And this is the second instance that I can think of. There might be others. I forget, but those are the two big ones I can think of in terms of actually giving out a feat as part of a background selection. Yeah, it's funny you allude to uh, the, how optional certain things are when they appear to be the bedrock of the game. There's oh. been a lot of criticism of basically the design style of throwing a bunch of stuff in a pile and saying, look, oh, make your own game. <laughs> uh, which I understand why that people like the freedom that brings, but also feel like it gives the game kind of an unfocused uh, vision. And they're like, basically there is a tabletop game that is better at everything D&D does because they refuse to commit. Right. You know, that's one of the criticisms that people bring up is the fact that by trying to appeal so broadly um, and not just picking an identity and leaning into it, it leads to these sort of wishy-washy sort of stances on keywording, rules design and stuff. I could go on for hours. I have gone on for hours on the Discord about this topic <laughs> and comparing other games and such. But, um, but yeah, like it's, you know, these backgrounds... They're fine. They have some nice little flavor in there. I do think it's kind of interesting how for the Astral Drifter, they they just say flat out, you are 20 D6 years older than you look because you spent that much time in the Astral Sea without aging, which is, I think that's kind of cute uh, as a little bit of a touch on there. Um, but the one of the things I find that 5th edition leaned into heavily over time has been just throwing a lot of of well as they like to call them racial options to players because they are fairly easy to design and package and it's an easy way i think to broaden appeals just by having a lot more ways for your character to look yeah the, the hardest thing is classes because you yeah. have to ba balance the damage output so there's no classes in here but the the easier things of background and race are uh the first one the astral elf Mm -hmm. uh, which is also the focus of the adventure path we will be talking about, uh, is kind of the one of the iconic villains of Spelljammer is that the, the elves are evil and like basically uh, fascist. Um, <laughs> it's a kind of inversion of the idea that like, more, usually elves are like really uh, smart and uh, regal and perfect and beautiful. Uh, the inversion of this, which is not in the book, is the scrow, uh, which... <laughs> You might notice Scro is orcs backwards. Uh, we love to see it. Uh, the sc the Scro are Spelljammer's good orcs. Uh, not not in this book at all. Not even mentioned. I don't think I, I read them all, but I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the the original Spelljammer joke: is what if elves were evil and orcs were good? We only got the evil elves, so that's interesting. Yeah, we just thought Scro was too silly, which fair. And and like. It's one of those things where even if you look at how the write-up for the Astral Elves are made for the player options, you know, that sort of, like, uh, inherent coding of them being evil is not really – it's not really put out there because it's a player option. But, yeah, looking through the adventure path, we'll get there. Um, I do think it's neat how they have – they look at this like these are basically just space elaborate. They got the phase step. It's just called starlight step. <laughs> and um, – Everything else yeah, the Eladrin are another thing that have undergone a lot of change. They were introduced in, in Planescape as kind of like angel elves, and then now they're like season elves in um, yes fifth edition. They have like well, autumn the, forms, winter forms. Well, and that's and that's the second version because the original version of Eladrin in fifth edition was the DMG option, which I used for the basis of Elias and all the Eladrin Valamins. Um, mm -hmm. which, which, you know, they were, they were very different than what they became by the time the Feywild books came out. They're like, no, they're seasonal and they have all these other things going on, which I guess, sure. It, it's their approach to, to make them way more Feywild adjacent. But like I said, the Astral, uh, Astral Elves, I'm looking at them and like, hmm, they can get Sacred Flame as an inherent cantrip and they have all the other standard elf qualities. So, you know. Yeah, there's the, basically fantasy fiction has been trying to reinvent the elf for like half a century at this point. There's usually called high elves, but there's always like a fancier elf. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, yeah. And, and high elf does make a return, I believe, in one D and D. So yeah, by the time we talk about that, they that whole thing might change even further. Um, oh lord, yes. save me from the elves. Save me from. Well, we got something next to the line here alphabetically. We got the auto gnome. Um, 
which now this is an interesting case because Warforged already exist and are very prominent in the Eberron material. So how do you how do you feel about they did a job distinguishing another robot person? Well, I, I think the it's kind of funny because I'm trying to think. Um, I think when people first saw the Autonomes, they thought they were more like what is it the what was the oh shoot the the little robot, what was Swift Justice? In a, a Modron, right? Modron. Yeah, so yeah. I think people thought that these were like Modron adjacent, but no, you know, they, these are mechanical beings built by rock gnomes, and the, and autonomes are things that were from the original Spelljammer, but they looked way sillier in the original <laughs> compendium. They look like, it's like, okay, what if, Tony Stark in a power suit, but their head is just a gnome head. It's just like, what if what if Vimble was actually Iron Man as opposed to Batman? Is sort of the energy I get when I look at the auto gnome art from back when. But yeah, these are, you know, these are. I mean, I guess they're fine. I don't have any particular issue for it because they are mechanically fairly different from how the Warforged turned out. Um, they also have their nice little autonome history table, which I could see here. Uh, there's some options here that speak very much to me. I'll, I'll say this. I'm someone who's usually very fond of construct characters and AI adjacent things. So when I see something like, oh, gosh, the bottle gnomes. <laughs> yeah, I just put a, a Magic the Gathering card bottle gnomes, which I think is the inspiration for uh, or vice versa for the original design where they are just what if gnomes or little robots? Pretty much. Yeah. Um, like, I see, like, the options. Your creator gave you autonomy and urged you to follow your dreams. Your creator died, leaving you to fend for yourself. A glitch caused you to forget your original programming. You don't remember who made you or where you came from. Uh, you didn't like how you're being treated, so you ran away from home. I'm like, well, okay. These are all, these are all well and good. Uh, do do, do. The other do, thing do Warforged benefit from healing spells? Because one of the autonome traits is they are... Uh, healed by healing spells, mm. and I thought that was just uh, the same for Warforged, is it not? Well, th that's interesting, because I remember Warforged at one point being like that, but I also remember that they changed the typing for Warforged specifically in order to allow them to actually be able to be healed. Um, I'm trying to remember the actual terminology in here, but um, yeah, if if Warforged are creature type humanoid, then that's fine. It yes. specifically says auto gnomes are constructs, and then it says uh, you, things that normally wouldn't heal constructs heal you, and also mending can heal you, which yes. is unique. Yeah, to to point out in the final version of the Warforged, it just says although they are manufactured, Warforged are living humanoids. Resting, healing magic, and medicine skill all provide the same benefits to Warforged that they do to other humanoids. So that is, if that was, I think that was different in 3rd edition, but they made it streamlined in 5th. But for the Autonomes, nah, they just leaned into the fact that they're constructs, which, hey, that's fine. That creates a little bit of simulationism that a party has to deal with. But, you know, just get a an artificer in the party, even though there's no artificer spells added they, they they've done the artificer dirty in this edition <laughs> the only thing i can think of is that it may leave your auto gnome character weak to things that deal double damage to constructs like certain uh sonic mm. attacks certain like, thunder damage yeah like shatter or something like that for sure um yeah that's a, that's a good point it's uh the one thing i will say though in exchange they make the point about how like well they got the mechanical nature so resistance to poison damage immunity to disease um and they have basically half trance so they don't they don't get the benefits of a long rest in four hours but they get it in six hours so sure that's fine and they also get tool uh two tool proficiencies which for whatever that's worth. Um, but overall, I mean, they're probably fine. I'm pretty sure that anyone play them is going to use the silliest of voices when playing. I do like the <laughs> Autonome Bard art they have with the little rapier and the uh, five-string harp, I think, is what they have there. That's pretty good. 
<laughs> yeah, the art is pretty good. I, I would say that I was really disappointed with the last couple of books, um, not because the quality was low, but just because a lot of it was reused from Magic the Gathering cards, Absolutely. and not just the not just the Magic tie-in stuff like Strixhaven. Specifically, there was the uh, Treasury of Dragons, mm. which is not not a tie-in to Magic in any way, but used uh, largely Magic published art. And so uh, that was, I feel like, a pretty huge uh, cost-cutting measure. Where this Spelljammer book seems pretty, pretty legit. All fresh stuff, all really high-quality stuff. And I, and I think they've also been getting better at actually crediting their artists on a more regular basis in these uh, mm -hmm. stuff. I think they actually credit artists even on the one D and D announcement. So like, and I also like how we have different artists involved in the in a very short proximity so it gives us a nice range of aesthetic approaches because mm -hmm. the autonomes definitely look like someone else drew them up compared to the astral elves and well the next race on our list here yeah this is really what we came here to talk about i feel like people probably fast forwarded to this part this is what you want uh, it's the hippo people. It's the Liam Myra Melbeck, the most popular character. <laughs> uh, it's it's the GIF, or as the description jokes, the GIF. That's right. The fact that they devoted a, a paragraph to this little joke here, but just like, fine, fair enough. I remember back when Laura was thinking about playing as a GIF in the first place, and I'm just sitting here thinking, like, I didn't even know they were even designed up as a player option, but people were already homebrewing GIF as a player race option on D&D Beyond, so that was easy to sort of, like, slide in and just justify. But, yeah, uh, and, and as far as I can tell, they're pretty much as they've always been, more or less. Yeah, they got the firearm uh, mastery, which is the kind of thing I gave Liam Myra back then, which is that you ignore, like, uh, loading and stuff. Uh, attacking at long range with the firearm doesn't impose disadvantage on your attack roll. Yeah, they're gun, they're gun hippos. Uh, interestingly, they are medium. I would have definitely uh, not been shocked if they had been large. Uh, I, yeah, they've they've avoided I think making any player races large. I think in the entirety of fifth edition and any of the final released versions of things, um, uh, like like that's just been one of those design heuristics that they've leaned into that people have have umbrage with along with their handling of centaurs. I know is another thing that people looked at and like. Uh, that that ain't it, this ain't it, Chief, you know, so. Yeah, it seems like a small change, but when you have, like, uh, certain things already baked into the game, like, where it's like, oh, a large creature can't be, like, pushed by the spell, or mm -hmm. you have things changing size with uh, reduce and large or whatever, it actually could cause a cascading effect where you end up with some kind of peasant railgun situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also wild because, like, medium size ranges from, like, four four feet and like you know, just about five feet to like eight feet because even goliaths at eight feet tall no no no, they're still medium <laughs> so yeah that I, I was definitely thinking if there was any large it'd be uh, goliath or fear bulg but um yeah the gifts are pretty pretty cool they're uh they have swimming speed as as hippos i like that as well um they are the iconic thing. I feel like if you were like, oh, let's play a spell jammer campaign, the question isn't, are you going to be a GIF? It's like, is there going to be any non-GIF characters? Yeah. I think their answer to the size matter is the whole like hippo build trait where you count as one size larger when determining carrying capacity. So that way it's like, well, no, no, you're not large as a creature, but you can carry as much as a large creature. So that's the same. So... Yeah, that's that's pretty clever. It doesn't fuck with any of the pre-existing stuff, but it mm -hmm. lets you corner case. The only other thing is the astral spark. It's this idea that they have a psychic connection to the astral plane, and it can use it to ad uh, inflict additional force damage. I don't remember anything in previous material like this. Mm -hmm. uh, it's possible I I'm forgetful. It's been, oh my gosh, two years since Markov, but um, that feels new, but also not particularly wild. It's just like, oh, they're from space. They have a space connection. They can do a little space magic. Yeah. Uh, okay. And, and it's like, it's extra force damage. The only thing I look at when it comes to this is whether or not a monk's unarmed strike counts as a simple or martial weapon because Wizards is very good at acting like the monk's unarmed strike doesn't count as a weapon for a lot of things like D Divine Smite. So I wouldn't be surprised mm. if Jeremy Crawford would have a ruling saying yes or no on this. And I'm like, they they could have had that clear there. But yeah, it's cute. It works. And just like 
all contemporary um, racial traits that have like charges. It's use it a number of times equal to proficiency bonus, recharge after long rest. So no complaints there. Yep, I expect we'll be seeing gifts in the show soon. Uh, next up, Hado Z. Uh, there was a cameo of a Hado Z in season five when they went to the cult compound. Uh, they ran into one. I just thought it was a funny little creature in the old books that no one knew about. And uh, I believe Quinn uh, tried talking to it in a monkey language, uh, just doing like a chimp impression. And it was like a funny scene, but it, it didn't have like lore implications or anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, but now the, the Hado Z are, I, I think, much more prominent now they're kind of a, a science experiment uh that that has become uh you know sapient uh after all kinds of um i don't know what's this it says an elixir i think in the description yep. that they got from wizards yep uh, it says the wizard fed the captives an experimental elixir that enlarged them and turned them into sapient bipedal beings um so and yeah they're like sugar glider chimpanzees basically yeah and uh, the art definitely gives that vibe all the way there. Um, I think I'm going to use them uh, more more going forward. I think the little joke I had, which is like, oh, the audience won't know what these are and they'll think it's a funny idea. Uh, but now it's just like, oh, no, this is a legit creature. It can kind of do a little bit of flying, but not like break uh, balance. <laughs> but like, like an arrow coker just going over a puzzle. Mm-hmm. Uh, it has a, an interesting little backstory. You can ask a lot of questions. Uh, this is it's, – it's some good stuff. And uh, they also fit really well into – uh, any kind of ship born either in space or on the ocean because they can like fly from uh, rigging to rigging, which yep. I think is uh, a great uh, visual. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I also find that the glide property, because of how it's written, it's like you could fall from potentially 80 height and just not take damage, you know, just. I yeah. Just, so, and I'll, I do like the little resistance trait in there, dexterous feet. Whenever I see. Uh, I was looking at this, and I'm like, if you're doing some more magic adjacent, I'm just like, what if Ixalan but in space? And then you could just – these would just be your goblins in, in this uh, replacement. Yeah, in that the, case. they do have – yeah, if you, if you don't know magic in Ixalan, one of the one of the planes of that um, lore, the goblins look very different. They're almost like ape-like pirates, uh, and this is very much a piece of that. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. They're They're so good. <laughs> It is a great aesthetic. I've actually thought about trying to like bring something like that onto the show. Be like, no, this is a different kind of goblin. But just in an audio medium, I just don't think it hits the same way. No, no, no. So you, yeah, but the Hado Z being a thing, that's a pleasant surprise. I think the bigger uh, pleasant surprise for a lot of people um, than Hado Z are the plasmoids because there's certain characters people think about when they look at well, the little trio of art right there for the plasmoids. <laughs> Yeah, this is one of the big things that people on social media have been saying. Oh, they stole your plasmoid. Um, plasmoids were in the old books, but they were not prominent. They were not player character options. Uh, th- th- this is a big glow up for the plasmoid, which is essentially just a living jelly. It's a, you know, it's a flubber, yep. a big flubber. Or it can be a small flubber. The size, actually, you get to choose medium or small, which is interesting. Yep. Um, the art on these are incredible. I just tweeted one of the ones in a, in the later book, which is just a, a jelly man with a gun, yeah, <laughs> which oh. really tickles me. I, it, it, it's uh, great. I, I also just like how they just show one of the plasmoids just like as like no libs, just a little slime, just just a little guy, mm-hmm. a little guy or gal or little ooze. Well, yeah, as, as Slime taught us last season, uh, the slime molds have th- like over 200 genders. So mm-hmm. who knows? Um, the amorphous, you can squeeze through a space as narrow as one inch wide, prepare, provided you are wearing and carrying nothing. That's sick as hell. Yep. Uh, potentially game breaking. Uh, shape self, you can re-change, you reshape your body to give yourself uh, a head, two arms, two legs, or you can revert to a limbless blob. I actually like uh, just how, a lot of fun stuff. I actually like the thought they 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 specify they can have a head, one or two arms, one or two legs. So I'm just like, mm-hmm. cool. Um, and the the the, I, the art of the uh, the ranger plasmoid on a space hamster is also just very good. Uh, <laughs> yeah space hamster is also something uh you know that, that was featured in markov uh not made famous by Spelljammer, although it wasn't Spelljammer, made famous by baldur's gate yep with uh boo who got their name on one of these books um 
So plasmoids are great. I, in this season, one of the main characters, Fortunato, is a plasmoid. And I joked that um, when these books came out, they were going to contradict a lot of stuff I said about my plasmoids, which they do. Like uh, they don't have any ability here to like give their biomass away, which is something Fortunato does in the, in the season that is mm-hmm. ongoing as of this recording. So uh, I was there first. They should really uh, issue a correction to give plasmoids that ability. I, I, the one thing about plasmoids I find interesting is the fact that they have an ability to hold their breath for one hour. I'm just like, hold their breath? That That's... Yeah, what breath? What breath? <laughs> <laughs> just... um, yeah, actually, one, one of the things I have is uh, Fortunato talks uh, weird because they don't have lungs or a diaphragm, which are the way, you know, you and I are shaping our speech right now. So he talks like this because yeah. he's like squeezing his fucking internal sack to make this uh yeah so it's, yeah it's all frick it's all fricatives and nothing else in terms of the 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 phoneme so is a very nice <laughs> detail there love a ling- l- linguist terminology uh last up here i have the thrycreen which have shown up in a number of books but the original monster manual i think one of the uh eberron books or something they're a dark sun staple and also a spell jammer staple uh this is pretty much your basic stuff the chameleon carapace the second arms uh not really much to say here one, this was a main character in season seven so we talked a lot about thrycreen um but they're bug people and uh, they're pretty cool. Mm-hmm. It's um, it's interesting because there's another game I've been looking at called um, Icon, and I won't del- delve too much in there. But they have a insect slash crustacean race called the Zixo, and mm. and in there, um, the designer makes a note about how they don't actually have telepathy like the Thrytreen the Thrykreen do, but what they have is a high sensitivity to pheromones and chemicals, so they can communicate directly with pheromones, which appears like telepathy. Um, so I'm not sure if that was necessarily a direct sort of commentary on the Thrykreen having telepathy, but I think it's an interesting just sort of way where, you know, insect-like creatures having a nonverbal form of communication as a focal point. I also find neat how Thrycreen are creature type monstrosities, so for wherever that's relevant. Yeah, I think in Season 7 we did let Laura talk normally, uh, but her, uh, her Thrycreen developing its telepathy and psychic powers was also like their entire personal arc and plot. So we like we talked about that, but we, I was also it's also like when I play Kenku, mm-hmm. which in many editions uh, canonically can only sp- uh, repeat things they've heard, like parrots, and can't form new sentences. I kind of like hand wave that a little bit just for ease of role play. But I still they still have mimicry as an ability. It's just not also a limitation. Which mm-hmm. I mean I think you could argue that you know we should <laughs> embrace that more, but it's hard enough doing a lot of stuff on, on the show. <laughs> Especially if someone is, I could just imagine a fan keeping a dictionary of every term the Kenku has heard. It's like, ah, they should have been able to say uh, that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that's, that's it for the racial options. We're going to probably move faster through the book now, but yep. this, this next part is a lot of lore stuff. We talked about the gravity and the air envelopes. Like I said, I don't intend on going too hard in any space seasons we do on this stuff i feel like people have internalized uh what you might call like star wars star trek rules of space Mm -hmm. and that is pretty uh sufficient i do like uh there's only a couple spells here one is air bubble which uh you know does exactly what it sounds puts an air bubble over your head and i feel like uh i in season five i kind of (gasps) said oh i hiccuped i said um if you go outside the ship you will not asphyxiate immediately because you have like a little uh, chip in you, which creates a little air bubble around you for a short time. Like basically I in lore explained that this spell, the spell exists and the book now makes it a castable thing. So they were kind of, we're, we're, we're on the same road. We're just in different lanes as far as air bubble goes. My favorite detail about the air bubble spell is the fact that it says if the creature has more than one head, it makes one air bubble but that should be all that the creature needs assuming it only has one respiratory system for all of its heads which i'm like really uh, that just feels like a lot to add is like a, a a thing to just explain away that possible edge case there so uh yeah silly details there the other spell they have in here is create spell jamming helm 
which oof, that's a that gets to a whole new thing yeah that's uh, yeah one of the interesting things about Spelljammer, or really to me one of the funniest things is that it was kind of made under duress uh there was originally there was kind of like a boom in sci-fi and tsr wanted to capitalize on it and they, so they told their designers this is how the story goes anyway is that they were like yeah just make a sci-fi thing we'll just k- kick it out the door and that's why it's it's often very silly and kind of unbalanced because the designers were kind of just you know, they were just Calvin balling it a little bit. Mm-hmm. And one of the elements of that is how many things are called spell jammers. Uh, the ships in the setting are called spell jammers. Uh, the controls are called spell jammer helms. Uh, there is a mystical ship in the setting called the spell jammer. Uh, the act of flying is spell jamming. <laughs> uh, the people who drive the ships are spell jammers. Like <laughs> the branding is just so silly. Um, but the, the spell jammer helm as a specific item, uh, it, may, it may surprise you to learn that what that means is the captain's seat. Yep. <laughs> That's all that means. That they're just fancy chairs. And the art of these are like, uh, there's a red chair f- over a, f- a fire sigil. There's a blue chair over a local, uh, ice sigil. And mm-hmm. there's like a purple chair over like a poison sigil. And uh, they all have like, you know, different backs and arms. <laughs> it's like creating your own custom fancy chair. Mm-hmm. It is. I also find fascinating how they make a point how in order for the chair in order for the ship to like work or otherwise it has to be at least one ton or more again a detail i'm like okay sure why not i also find it wild because um the uh the they make a big point about how fast you can move in space with the with spell jamming, so they even have a line in here where, if the ship is in space and no other objects weighing one ton or more are within one mile of it, you can use a spell jamming helm to move the vessel fast enough to travel one hundred million miles in twenty four hours. It's that's also kind of like in that same category of Calvin balling. Like, oh, you could go like I don't know, hundred million miles in a day. Sure. Why not? Yeah, it, it's one of those things where they're like, oh, we want to have some kind of internal uh, astron- astronomy to this. Like, we have these pictures of the astral sea and the wild space and what was the doom space. Um, but it's like also, you know, uh, it's also nonsense. <laughs> and so I feel like you can you can choose to skip or ignore a lot of this. I'm personally uh, not really in, in – in, invested in a lot of these uh, measurements and ideas. I think they're fine if you want to implement them, if you yourself don't know where to start with this. But like I said, I, I tend to default to Star Trek or St- uh, Star Wars logic <laughs> when it, with all these uh, mm-hmm. numbers and stuff. And they and in terms of like starting out in here, uh, we'll get this here in a little bit, but they offer a pretty wide range of well, vessels for you to do your spell jamming on. <laughs> sure, yeah, that's the rest of this book. Uh, we can get to in just a moment. The last thing I want to say is I think the selection of magic spells and magic items are anemic. Yes. We got two spells, three items. Uh, I'm not happy, honestly. I was hoping for more. That's one of the things that I think <laughs> is the most useful about these books. Yeah. Uh, honestly. Uh, agreed. Uh, for exa- for, it, yeah. It, it's just because, like, you know, you look at the number of vessels, and it's like, how many of these are you going to end up using across your campaigns? That might be questionable. You might use a handful of vessels, but if you have a robust number of items and spells, those are all probably going to be touched on at some point. And so, again, it's just like, here's one design space, very underutilized. Here's a different design space that's very world-building centered, that's deeply spread out. I'm like, well, that's a weird place to spend all your attention. Yeah, it was one of my main criticisms there. Now that we get to the ship part, I will say go back and listen to season five. I mentioned maybe half of these ships, um, but it's once again because it's an audio medium. It's not like they, besides the Nautiloid, maybe mm-hmm. make a huge impression. I mentioned like, oh, it's a Neogi Night Spider. It's a ship that looks like a weird blood filled insect, and it's like that's a cool image. And then it's like it, the fact that it is that never really comes up mm-hmm. again. It's just like a it's it, it's flavor really. Where in the book they give you all these chambers and they essentially make ships into dungeons, which is to me one of the most interesting like aspects of Spelljammer because I find traditional dungeon design and implementation really 
inorganic. Mm -hmm. uh, like when I'm writing a setting or an adventure, I have to really <laughs> kind of contort things to why is there a dungeon here? Why are people putting treasures in these chests how is there why are there monsters here like none of that is anything to me mm -hmm. i know it's tradition uh but it, it's really rare i put a, a dungeon ass dungeon in a campaign unless i really can make it make sense organically and having these ships be dungeons where they're like no this is a living quarters you can loot it here's like you know the the crew quarters where you fight and like I'll, I'll, it's almost dungeon-esque and that's how I, I intend to use these things more of as like floating dungeons. Like you board them and then dungeon crawl through them. So I, I also do love looking at the different maps, um, just like the the ballistas, the little like crossbows that are set up on the ships as firearms, because, again, they you can shoot those things without needing um, without needing anything special. But like the ballistas and Every single ship, it seems, has its own sort of detailed outlining of the weaponry that's on it, the layout size. And as you said, like if you're doing like a space piracy campaign or something, well, here's your here's all your dungeons basically with their own built in weapon setups and all that stuff. Yeah. You need to do a whole podcast just on running like ship to ship combat. I think, um, not to name drop, but the Adventure Zone had a season recently where they did kind of ship to ship combat, and the DM Griffin like did a bunch of, I don't know what you call it, like homebrew stuff that was rarely actually ever used. And you know, not not to start drama or anything. I personally don't think it's worth the effort to try to make your own game on top of another game. And I would much more basically make it with like some kind of initial role uh, to get them into close combat and then have boarding action and then do the thing that the game was designed, which is have your characters fight other characters. Yeah, and they and they even have a brief area about ship-to-ship -ship combat um, above the – before the vessels. I have a quick question for you. So just based on just raw aesthetics, um, which one of the vessels in the book just kind of jumps out at you uh, – personally because i have one that i really oh. like out of here that's interesting yeah the we said earlier the nautiloid is the most iconic one but the one that i the one i think i like the most is the uh astral elf star moth mm. which is a uh kind of a green winged ship it's, it's actually a plot point in the adventure path we'll get to uh but it has these beautiful huge wings yeah uh, i think that's I, I think it comes up in markov uh, briefly but yeah that's that's one of my favorites the star moth I, i'm i'm really fond especially with the way they do it with the art of the turtle ship i just love the way that it looks <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. Yeah, I don't know if this is clear. All the ships in Spelljammer are just animals. It's just the wasp, the hammerhead, the yep. turtle. The, yeah, they're all just uh, nautiloids. Are there's a creature called a nautilus? Uh, so it is just that animal. Avo uh, is a ship. Once again, the Spelljammer uh, designers didn't exactly have a ton of time and money to like make a a, a believable uh, breathing world. Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't exactly doing Dune. Uh, so it's it's a it's a pretty silly it's a it's a funny setting. Yes, it is. I, I think that's the other point too. There's like you can, you can't be too self serious about how the world works and such because you know it just just kind of go with it. it. It's 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 wild space magic stuff. So you know have some fun with it. Um, it is it is it is hippo people uh, riding on turtle ships fighting monkey people on moth ships like just if you try to fight that <laughs> you're you're not really getting what you paid for <laughs> Um, and the last section of the book is a little setting vignette, the Rock of Brawl, which yes. is, once again, a low effort joke on the, the Rock of Gibraltar, mm -hmm. um, which is basically, this is something they would revisit it went with uh, Planescape, I believe in 94, so five years later, which is uh, to give the setting a, an iconic location, the way Sigil is. Or Planescape, it's just kind of like the center of life. It is like the New York of Spelljammer. It's where everything is. That's where you'll, you know, get quests and uh, downtime. And it's just where everything is. Um, I don't know how much I'm going to get in here because it's like, oh, here are the sections of the city. Here are some important characters. And it's like, mm -hmm. if I was playing it, I would rip a lot of this out. I would do my own kind of thing. Except for 
except for mm-hmm. Large Luigi. I was gonna say, like, 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 you're, <laughs> Large Luigi is the star of the Rock of Brawl. I just the art, <laughs> just the name, uh, just yeah. there's it's just the, the the fact that he works at the Happy Beholder is just like sure, great. Perfect. I don't remember if Large Luigi is from anything. I assume a Google search could confirm if it was like a novel or, you know, something. I don't remember Large Luigi. It's fucking incredible and a great note to end that book on. Uh, Large uh, Luigi, apparently there's a reference in second edition where he was formerly lawful evil, then became lawful neutral. So, you know, um, it's good for him. Yeah, good for him. Yeah, yeah, a little bit of another, a little bit of a glow up thing there. But yeah, uh, and then mentioned in a novel called The Maelstrom's Eye. So I think that's kind of where uh, that's sort of where that this is a callback for. But yeah, uh, I, the art for Large Luigi is so good. Um, <laughs> it's great. So that's the first book. We took fifty minutes. I assume the other ones are going to be shorter. Uh, but here's the next one is Booze Astral Menagerie. Mm-hmm. That is the uh, the monster manual. I don't know if you want to read uh, anything in here. I'm actually going to stand up and go turn the light on because as we are recording, it has now gotten too dark to read. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. So um, for those that don't know, Boo itself uh, is a hamster. Um, it is something that was. Uh, made very popular in the game Baldur's Gate uh, as the pet of Minsk. Uh, and Minsk refers to Boo as a miniature giant space hamster. So, you know, there's the giant space hamsters, which are a spell jammer thing. And then Boo is just a miniature giant space hamster, which, you know, that's just all well and good. Uh, one of the other things that they do very quickly at the beginning of of the Astral Menagerie, in fact, we get here is we got to get into the disclaimer, which is being told by Boo himself saying, <clears throat> disclaimer, squeak, squeak, translation. You're on Boo's turf now, world hugger. Unless you want a hamster knuckle sandwich, you better watch where you're spell jamming. And before you blow up a nautiloid, make sure there are no space hamsters aboard it. Otherwise, prepare the face the wrath of Boo. So... A fair enough disclaimer and just playing well into the notion of these books with a re- with a person's name, an entity's name on it, you know, adding to the flavor in there. Um, I, do I love th- the the focus on Boo on the next page. There's like a quote and it says squeak and then it's attributed to Boo. Yep. So they really just <laughs> they really went full haul. He is very cute. Yes, it, it is. It is great. Um they they also point out how to make astral variants of creatures. Just yeah, this is actually very notable because the original Spelljammer books were filled with garbage. <laughs> by which I mean they t- they took something from the old book and then added the word space to it and then acted like it was new. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a ton of that shit, and so this book just says, "Hey, you can add space to something, <laughs> and it doesn't waste your time and energy with uh, reprinting all that." And so, honestly, huge thumbs up there. <laughs> yeah, that, that that keeps the bestiary relatively lean in a good way because it keeps it just like okay, here's things that aren't just space something though they do have a space something they do have a handful of space something in the beast in the beast here which we'll get to because some of these are just uh so uh instead of going through everything in here uh, i guess the big thing looking at the collection of the menagerie what are the standouts that you found when you're leafing through this yeah, so though I do want to go over a couple of standouts here. The first thing I alluded to this earlier is you're not going to find the solitaire in here, right. which is a creature I made up in season five in which a lot of – I've gotten a lot of messages of people saying that they're not in here. Um, and <laughs> that's because they're not from Spelljammer. Uh, that was just – that's an Austin original. And I got, maybe this is egotistical. I'm just – I'm glad everyone enjoys them and thinks that they – are deserving of official status, but uh, that's a, that's me, not Spelljammer. Mm-hmm. Um, so with with that out of the way, uh, I will say first up alphabetically is the Artux, which is a, one of my favorite designs. I don't recall these from the old books. If mm. they are in there, their art was not memorable. Like <laughs> these are, they are essentially um, the spiny. 
uh, sea stars. I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, real creature. They're like a carnivorous uh, starfish. Mm. Uh, but ba- but these are plants, which is interesting. There, are, in my opinion, not enough plant creatures in D and D. There are the blights and the treants, but that's well, not it's not it, but it's really the only ones that come to mind. Yeah. So some these are really cool looking. Well, and and yeah, like you're alluding to, like there's. The designs are really cool, and I think why I, I also just like about their design is, um, you know, because like the, these are intelligent. These are plant creatures that actually you know can run their own ships. They, um, they have a little bit of history about how beholders destroyed their original home world, and they you know. And their and their language, I like their language description. It's a made up of rustling sounds, snaps, pops, and hisses. It has no written form, so a lot of sibilant sounds that'd be great to capture in audio only format. Yeah, I just I just looked it up again, and yeah, they they are in one of the old books. There's one low quality image in one of these books, and it does not do anything for me. I'm looking at it now. It has a similar, uh, it looks like, you know, a, f- a five-pointed or six-pointed plant creature, mm-hmm. but uh, it doesn't spark joy. And yeah. all three of the ones in this book spark intense amounts of joy. Yeah, it, uh, the art, I think I'm looking at the same art, and it looks like we look at the Artuk priest in particular. It's like, okay, the Artuk priest is taking that original idea, but making it way more uh, engaging aesthetically. Um, also, so I think. I tr- truly nailed that one. Oh, yeah. And the fact that all spider climb, perfect. No changes there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, so, look, looking through the monster manual, uh, one to point out is the Dowar, which are intelligent penguins. Uh, one of these shows up in Markov, so I'm, I'm glad they got a shout out. They're basically just like, um, <laughs> they're the kind of the, the stereotype of the merchant alien, mm-hmm. which you might know of like the Ferengi from Star Trek or that uh, weird little guy from the Phantom Menace. Um, but they're just penguins, and I thought that was funny, and I took that, and I'm glad to see they're here. Um, but, does any any other ones catch your eye? Um, so the I, I do like the the handful of little like deeper dives into stuff like you have the Kindori. We've already talked about those. Um, I do find it interesting how we have both lunar and solar dragons, and those are two distinct mm-hmm. things with their own little details. And I was leafing through this, and I have to bring this up because they just have this name in here. They have two names in here that just jump out at me. One is the murder comet. Um, uh-huh. <laughs> the art for it, which is just amazing. It just looks like it's just a f- comet that's a face that is very sinister, which um, is very good. Uh, I, I just find that just to be pretty wild. Um, the only thing about that I can find as of note here is that um, it, it's meant to be representative of the creator of it there. So it basically... Uh, it can be made by anyone who is sufficiently evil enough to want to put out a murder comet. But then they have space clowns as a thing. There's other space yeah. things, but space clown. Um, we were going to get here, but like um, <laughs> most of these books, I was like reading through all three and thinking like, yeah, you know, I did this already. I did this already. Like, oh, that's fun. That's clever. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, Space Clown was the only one I saw and it said like, oh, I'm going to use this. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, the first sentence, Space Clouds are the inhabitants of a wild space system known as Cloud Space. I'm like... <laughs> It's it's so specific. It's like one of those things that like if I had this idea, I would probably not use it because I'd be like, it's it's too much. It's too on the nose. It's too goofy. But now they've given me permission to implement it. I can say like, no, it's from the book. They're clowns. It's in clown space. My, my response is who let Mark Rosewater walk in and write this up, you know, <laughs> just kind of. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, fuck clowns. <laughs> just goddamn. Um, but the uh, I'm trying to think of the other ones that kind of jumped out at me. Um. They have the- I will say that the, the Mercane are in here. Mm-hmm. Uh, some In some editions, they're called the Arcane, but obviously that's confusing because that's a kind of magic. Uh, I don't remember if they were giants. I guess they probably were, but here they're characterized as giants that love, once again, doing uh, trade. It's, it's a very common sci-fi trope is the trade species. 
Um, I, I'm not sure how I feel about that. There's a longer conversation. Well, many people have written long essays about the anti-Semitic uh, implications of the Ferengi. Mm. Uh, but I think in season five, I had a Mercane planned, but then at the end, I, I may have used a Fidalkin, which is a blue-skinned person from Magic the Gathering, because the Mercane are also blue-skinned. I'd have to go back and listen. But um, it's interesting that they, they're here uh, because uh, they are also featured in Planescape some. So uh, making them more firmly in the setting is, uh, you know, I think probably a good step to if they're releasing that Planescape material next year, making them more prominent there as well. I, I also like the um, the uh, the Rhaegar, I believe is how they pronounce them. The uh, the yeah, in season five, I called it the Rhaegar. Mm. Once again, pronunciation is you know it's Calvin Ball, but they they have. I think made some significant changes to the species. I don't know if I, I cut you off. I guess you want to talk about the Rygar. No, 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 no. You go ahead. You go ahead. Um, about like um, I, so. Yeah. The way that they're described in the old books is that they're extremely androgynous. I think I called them like the David Bowie aliens. <laughs> um, it's like the the females are masculine and the males are feminine. I guess is like how they're presented, and they have um they're very artistic. Like their whole thing is they love making art, and like it's like okay, they're androgynous artists. I don't know if this is like a weird, uh you know late eighties hair metal thing because they have weird hair. Uh, but I don't remember them being rainbow striped. Their skin is like blue and uh, pink, like cotton candy. I guess because the drawings were black and white. In those other books, maybe that was a uh, mentioned, not shown. Mm -hmm. uh, and they also have these um, these things that follow them around. What are they called here? The oh oh shoot 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 yeah the do, 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 do. you're you're talking about no that's it's not the uh, aesthetic. You know, the aesthetic is like they're, they're, they're creatures they can ride. I guess the, what they're called here is the Talarith. Right. I thought it was called something else. The, I think they changed that. Yeah, the jewelry, right, right, that they that they wear. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. The Rygar, it says Talarith. The Rygar creates this piece of jewelry, uh, chooses its form, bracelet, brooch, necklace. While it wears this, any weapon wielded by the Rygar deals an extra 1d6 force damage. As an action, a Rygar can use its Talarith to summon a golem that looks just like the Rygar. Um, I remember that they had a thing, because I, I reflavored it in Season 5 to be uh, flesh technology, mm. a lot of the movie Existens. So there definitely was something. I just don't remember it being called a Talarith. Hmm. I'm googling. You can you can continue talking about them if you want. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, I, I I mostly just particularly just liked the way that the they were depicted in. I think the what was the depicted um, is a shot of a Rhaegar with the the golem. It's the summoning summoning its own golem there, and the hair just being particularly. Uh, fun looking because the it makes me because they that the artists leaned into the idea of them, um, basically the the cephaloid, um, cephalopod rather the cephalopod esque sort of nature. So it's almost like it almost feels like uh like the the tendrils and such of like an octopus reaching out from their heads and such. They thought this is a really nice sort of look in there. Um. Yeah, so I'm I'm on the I'm, I'm on the Forgotten Realms Wikipedia here. It says uh, Rygar entered combat with their Servitor Helots and Lakshu mm. and relied on their Shock T. And there's no link to a Shock T. I think that's because the Lakshu were uh, uh, serv servants of the Rygar, which are not mentioned all here. But they do the aesthetics. They're kind of living ships are. Yeah. Um, but shock T is yes that that rings the bell as the, the thing they had, which is not here. I wonder why that was changed. I assume it's because it means something else. Mm -hmm. uh, shock T means power in Hindu philosophy. Yes, they changed it to not be mm, uh, appropriate, offensive yeah. to yeah. to Hinduism, which is a living religion. Also, why like I will have things from Greek mythology, Norse mythology, Celtic mythology. I tend to stay away from Hinduism because it is still a practiced world religion. <laughs> yep that 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 tracks there. Um, the only other thing I was going to note in all of this is, yeah, the last detail I find interesting is the fact that the um, their armor class has a glory sort of call out there. It's just their glory. The Rygar's armor class includes this charisma modifier. 
<laughs> and they have 24 charisma, so that's a uh, <laughs> it's a spicy armor class right there. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm reading now from this uh, Spelljammer book. Uh, this uh, the Shakti is a small statuette that resembles a figurine of wondrous power. Each Shakti is designed by and for its user, rendering each one a unique item. So the, it is similar to the Talarif, the thing that they have here, which is a piece of jewelry that can uh, turn into a, uh, a golem of them, mm. uh, but stripped of its Hindu. Uh, implications. That's. I think this is the this is the analysis you're only going to find here, folks. <laughs> if you just type in like a Spelljammer book review and you get some Yahoo talking about the balance of the new shit, uh, we aren't. We're not here for that. I'm here to give you the fucking inside scoop. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Uh. I'm I'm scrolling through this and I just scrolled past the uh, Solar Dragon art they got and just like love it. Perfect. The lunar and solar dragons. I actually Quinn sent me a message and was like, "Huh, lunar and solar dragons. That's legally distinct from moon and sun dragons, isn't it?" <laughs> uh, with the, the conflict of season five. Um, there's a, a Surian, which is also a dark sun thing, which are kind of a just a slightly different lizard folk. And in fact, it literally says Surian are lizard folk who have adapted to life in arid climates. Uh, I really seems like mostly a flavor difference the art they are much uh thinner Mm -hmm. they're like a different uh lizard i guess but once again hard to convey in an audio only medium yep and then immediately afterwards is the starlight apparition which uh that that is something that i look at that i'm like hmm i could use that for some stuff i got some ideas for that uh, but. Yeah, th- that comes up in the adventure path as a way. It's like if you kill a plot important <laughs> character, you can have them come back as the Starlight <laughs> Emper- <laughs> Apparition to deliver their exposition. It's like you kill you kill an NPC, and on their body is a recording of them talking about where you should go next <laughs> in the campaign. Uh-huh. It's just like <laughs> uh, as in addition to the clown uh, people, there's also vampirates. Uh, which I give that person a raise. That's a uh, that's the kind of pun that keeps people coming back. Mm-hmm. Vampires. I, I also suck the, me. I, I love that the vampires they have a specific line saying that they eat, drink, and sleep because they like to, not because they must. <laughs> um, uh. I'm just like, well, sure. They they listen. They're they're pirates. They gotta they gotta have their 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 meat and their rest because why not. <laughs> Uh, and then the final entry is the Zodar, which comes up in season five. It is, uh, it has actually the same kind of arc. Once again, this is probably uh, a coincidence. I'm not actually accusing wizards of stealing from me, but uh, in the adventure path we're about to discuss, uh, the Zodar is like the main henchman of one of the villains, and that is what happens in season five as well. And so I think if you're if you're keeping the tally of uh, things that are similar. Uh, that is a big one. The Zodar is just a giant suit of armor that is muscle all the way through. It only speaks three times, yep. uh, which is also something noted on the in the campaign we did. Um, but, you know, interestingly, uh, I had bigger plans for that, uh, which didn't come to fruition, which is fine. That's the way yep. the show works. Uh, but it also lets me maybe bring the Zodar back in a future space season, and maybe those mysteries will be unveiled there. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, yeah, no, no no changes from the old Spelljammer material. This is the Zodar I got from 1989. This is the Zodar you're getting in 2022. Yep, yep. Uh, all right. Well, that is the that's the menagerie, more or less, in terms of the highlights, at least. All right, and this is the last book, The Light of Zarzixis. The Zarzik Zik of Zar. The light. The, the light, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, disclaimer, yeah. this adventure wrecks havoc with your beautifully imagined homebrewed campaign world. We hope that your players will care enough about your world to save it. But if not, may we present the Rock of Brawl as an alternative? Just remember to leave your vendettas at the docks. That's extremely funny because the stakes of this are, yeah, the evil elves are going to blow up Earth. And at the end, you can be like... Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so yeah, if if your players are not invested in your homebrew, this is a great opportunity to to blow it up. Um, the the uh, cover photo of the astral elf villain and his solar dragon is pretty cool. Um, I actually before this book even came out, this uh, art was released and I had it saved. Uh, if you know, <laughs> uh, traditionally in season or episode one of each season, I do D and D art. 
uh, for the mm-hmm. YouTube channel or whatever. And I was like, this is a sick picture. We might use this. Yeah. Um, and I think there's another picture of that person with their solar dragon right in the introduction as well. So we got like two good solar dragon depictions in rapid uh, succession here. Yeah, the solar dragon in the story, I gotta say, it does not really have a personality. Uh, is also young and small compared to like the one that I had in season five, which was like just truly a, a, a galactic threat. Mm-hmm. In this one, it's basically a horse. <laughs> yes, it's a horse that the the elf villain rides around. So, uh, do you want to give us the premise of this? So, yeah, the. It basically, it, like it alludes to, the premise is that you're trying to save your home world from these astral elves. Um, and you are basically seeing a lot of the basic essential spell jammer space dwelling creatures. You'll meet an astral elf princess who's dealing with a power struggle with their 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 twin brother who is threatening the uh, who's threatening stuff. Uh, Prince was it uh, Zealeth? I believe. Sorry, you're gonna go with it. It's a lot of X. Yeah, they're it's like Zealeth and Zenith or something. They're both extremely Z- similar Z- names. Uh, and they're Z- uh, Zidali, I think, is the princess Zidali and Zealeth. So they're both extremely interchangeable. Uh, like spoilers, if you kill one, the other just takes their place. Just um, <laughs> they have no personality. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying that they are as two dimensional. It's like evil fascists go yeah they basically are there just to serve the to move the plot forward and like the contingencies built into it there's a lot of stuff in this adventure that is written in such a way where it's hard to card fail out of the adventure because even if things go wrong the plot still kind of moves the party forward along the way it also yeah mm -hmm. I know I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was just thinking about a couple of different ones, like where it's like uh, if you if uh, your party isn't doing well, someone shows up and saves them. Yes. It's like all right, so <laughs> don't, you can kind of just punch yourselves in the face until the cutscene starts. I guess. Yeah, punch yourself in the face. Cutscene starts. Gain a level. So listen, if you need an excuse to get your party from level five to eight, you know, hey, here you go. Here's your uh, here's your plot line there. Um, it's also- I'm going to talk a lot of shit about this, and I want you all to know that writing a, a adventure path like this is very hard. Yes, and I don't know that I could do better. Uh, making a you know A to B publishable product for people who want to improv is just it's an enormous task, it is. and I don't uh, envy it. And the, I hope if the, this gets back to the people who wrote it, uh, I'm sure you did a great job <laughs> with what you were given. And, uh, there's a couple of great characters in here. So please don't, uh, take what I'm saying as a personal attack. <laughs> right. Yeah. Writing an adventure path of any sort is not easy. And especially ones that are going to be ones that people are going to jump into and try to play early on as starter things, even fan Delver, which is getting a refresh in the next, uh, year, um, you know, even that can have huge issues to deal with depending on your, your table dynamics and stuff. And so there, there's at least efforts in here to assist a newer GM running the game to keep things moving forward. But it feels like in order to pull it off, there's a lot of like like weird assumptions and backbending in order to pull off some of those theatrics and such. So... That being said, uh, let's just go ahead and jump into it here. Yep. The, the, it starts, this is, a, I think, a, a venture for a level five character. Yes. Uh, you are in, it could be any city. I think it says, you, uh, you know, go to Sword Coast if uh, you don't have an idea of where to start. Mm-hmm. Uh, giant uh, seeds fall down from the sky, burrow into the ground, create giant vines, and then creatures come out. These are the astral blights. Mm-hmm. Uh, my first note here, I didn't actually take physical notes. My brain note is that this is an unwinnable fight that uh, is not particularly signposted to be so. You can just fight these Astral Blights for quite a while, and like it, you roll to see how many more appear. It says if the characters stay in a single location for more than a minute, one of these six Astral Blights converge on their location and attack them. Um, and knowing the groups I tend to play with, this would be where Sam and Mari die. <laughs> more or less. They, they get dropped out of zero hit points and then immediately declare they're dead. And then you have to say, that's not how this works. I've told you this many times. And, uh, and but yes, like it, it, the fact that it opens with a fight that the party is not meant to win is a choice. <laughs> um, it's not bad. It's not. It's fine. I, I love Paper Mario. 
<laughs> right. starts that but, way. But like you said, like signposting that clearly to the GM on the way in and and such is uh it's one of those things that's just like, oh wait, oh okay, that's how this is supposed to work. Um I can def I know I've played with some people in real life who would get frustrated and then they would keep fighting until they got knocked down and then they would be like, whatever, fuck you, I'm gonna go play video games. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, which speaks more to my my friend choices than the book, I guess. <laughs> uh, regardless of what you do, uh, which is uh, a theme we'll come back to, if whether you go to the, the docks or you escape the city, which are the two options presented, uh, you end up getting uh, sucked up in a spell jammer ship one way or another. Yep. Uh, I don't know if you want to speak to this. I understand you have to get the players to space. It's a space adventure. Uh, but starting with an unwinnable fight and a fake choice... Uh, is certainly a way to structure this. Uh, yeah, like, it's it's weird because you, there are ways you can get this to happen, I think, but the the tricky part about this as well is, like, you, you, you introduce the... You introduce the character, um, what, uh, Ala, Elena Startel, and she, I believe, just kind of shows up and tells the party, you know... Hey, you know, you should, you should, I'm going to go to my ship. You should come with me. And it's just like, you, you pr present it to the party and it's like, well, either you follow that advice or you are stuck in this unwinnable fight. And it just feels like, uh, I'll, I'll give a little bit of a personal experience. I was already lost mine at Fandelver. In the book, it makes a point about how the, the mayor of the community is afraid to go up against the 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 bandits that have sort of like holed up in the town and i was trying to explicitly tell the player who's trying to drop up one of the bandits to be put in the jail cell this person is unwilling to take this on because they are afraid and the and the player was unwilling to move on from that point for 20 minutes so <laughs> even something as simple as that can just grind a session to a halt and this really feels like it can grind the campaign to a halt unless you just find a way to get through it really quickly there um i almost think it would yeah, be it's one of those things that it could be very play group dependent because i feel like you could just have so like you hear someone in the uh in the crowd you're like run we're doomed or something and then you have a player be like yeah we should run or they could just not take the hint you never yeah. you never know what someone's gonna do uh and you can't control them. <laughs> like one of the things i would almost think is another way to open this would be like they they make friends with the the sailor. They get invited to just like look at the ship, and then the attack happens outside, and the ca and you know they just take off on the ship before the party has a chance to go and do something about it. You know, that's one way to hand wave around it. But that's definitely if a if a person's running this for the first time, they aren't used to how to railroad into the adventure. Yeah, <laughs> that, that. this isn't even the worst railroading uh, instance in here. There's one later that was astonishing to me. Like I gasped and put the book down, but we'll <laughs> get there. We're, um, we're, 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 I guess the main thing here is that we um we do we do have a we do have some good stuff coming up pretty soon. But yeah, it just opens pretty rough to say the least. So yeah, it tells you about a couple characters here. I'm not going to linger on it because none of these people have like uh, sparkling personalities. Once again, difficult to convey in a in a, this format, mm -hmm. especially when the players can just cut anyone's throat in at any time. Mm -hmm. uh, but the the standout is Flapjack the Flump. Yes, you know I'm a I'm a slut for flumps. I'm always putting them in, and this guy has a pirate hat with a big feather, and that is that rocks. Yeah, like I, I saw Flapjack, and I'm like, this is the star of the campaign and any party who is not going to immediately care about the well-being of flapjack is not a party i wouldn't be associated with um also just the fact that flapjack you know there's a lot that they do with flapjack at least uh, they do enough with flap uh, flapjack to be like yeah cool um it, the hat. I just love the hat. It's too much. <laughs> the hat is so good. Yeah, but the next the next story beat is that you, the ship that fired the seeds at your planet is the uh, the moth that I discussed previously as my favorite ship design uh, attacks you, and there's a big fight, and it can go a number of ways, uh, including uh, some of the people you picked up taking over your ship, mm -hmm. and it, it gives you little blocks for like what to do if you win or lose, or if you know this person's alive and stuff. I think this is actually pretty pretty good and clever. Mm -hmm. uh, it talks about questioning 
being both the uh, Astral Elves and their Hado Z. Uh, not slaves, but you know, minions, mm-hmm. mercenaries. It says. Uh, so all of this is pretty, pretty good. I don't really have any complaints about this stuff. Uh, I don't know if you have any more thoughts about no, that section. This, this is actually like I agree with you. This is the sort of stuff I look at. This like this is stuff that is useful as like beats for someone running the game. You got a handful of main options. Things are presented as broad beats, but not hard scripts, and it's easy to finesse around and create the illusion of pathing out to the next area without feeling like a hard railroad over. Um. Yeah, and you know, this can end with uh, your friend uh, helming the ship, your enemy stealing, or, you know, uh, what's it, uh, mutinying and taking the ship, mm-hmm. Travis, or you being a prisoner of the Astral Elves, and then it ends with a cliffhanger, which is, oh, no, a Nautiloid. And uh, this, I mean... Kind of exactly my style of DMing, honestly, is being like, listen, it can go any number of ways. And then I have, I have a cliffhanger into the music. <laughs> so uh, it's, it's, it's a very Austin style end of chapter. Yes. Um, and, you know, they're they're getting right to the Nautiloid pretty early on in whole things. I'm like, yeah, good. That is fine. I've also, as a small quibble about the formatting of this in D&D Beyond, um, when you are using the navigation stuff, you have like previous chapter and next chapter, like things to use a navigation bar. But by chapters, they mean parts, and the parts contain chapters. I'm just like, that's not mm. that's not fun, guys. It's like next chapter, you click there. Nope, that takes you to the next part of the campaign, not the next chapter, which is on the same page as you were presently. But yeah, uh, you. I don't know if we mentioned that I have the physical books. You're on the digital. Yes. If that matters for your listening experience. <laughs> yes. Uh, the amount of detail they go into the Nautiloid layout and stuff is what I would expect. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it is presented basically as a dungeon almost in how it's detailed out, which all that makes sense. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a very traditional, like a lot of the adventure paths for 5e uh, have uh, multiple sections of this size. This is a pretty short book, all things considered, mm-hmm. the 64 pages, compared to like Ascent from Avernus, which I feel like was like a chunkier book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this is, yeah, the, this is exactly what I was talking about earlier with using ships as dungeons. And there's a, a variety of different encounters with different aliens. you got yourself a Nethalgu, a Surlon, a Quagoth, uh, just, just a, a room rogues gallery of things here because uh it turns out that the nautiloid is derelict uh so you don't actually have to fight a bunch of mind flayers <laughs> which uh for a level what six party uh, a whole ship full of mind flayers not really a survivable <laughs> encounter you're level five because you don't actually gain a level until after you're done with this chapter of the campaign uh-huh. it even has a little call nice. at the end saying here ends part one of the adventure each character should gain a level before the next session so even in this case here, um, they've abstained from doing EXP base leveling. They're doing it based on milestones, which, you know, fair enough. That's all good. But yeah, yep. that, that's the last part. Uh, of I feel like every, everyone is going into that mode. I, I was a, a pioneer. I'm taking credit yep. <laughs> for the rise of the milestone level. Yeah, you, you um, go for it, you know. <laughs> Once again, we're ending this section on a cliffhanger as you leave the derelict a Niyogi Night Spider, uh, which is the, one, the the ship from the first episode of Markov, uh, shows up. And then it's like, oh, no, we're going to fight them. And then this is the one of the interesting sections where it's like, no, actually, uh, some other people show up and they can fight them. It's like, what? Mm-hmm. I don't know how you feel about this. To the Rescue is the name of this uh, uh, section, but I, you could also call it, uh, you don't have to play D&D if you don't want to. <laughs> Right, right. I believe that's. Oh shoot. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's the opening of the next chapter there. And like, yeah, um, I don't know. Yeah, look, this is something that I feel like that you would do for a party of level one characters in like sort of a if you're trying to do some sort of set piece, like you're escaping somewhere and you get to see like a foreshadowing of a later threat on the way out. But these are like level six characters by this point. So they want to, they're going to feel a little bit more like I want to get in there and do stuff, but 
Yeah. yeah. I'm not trying to call anyone out, but I've listened to a number of actual play podcasts, and I find this is actually a really common tactic, Mm -hmm. is to have an NPC show up to save the player characters to make that NPC seem cool. And my... My approach, I guess this is not, you know, right or wrong, it's just my approach, is that you want the player characters to feel cool mm. uh, and the NPCs to be, like, secondary. Yes. Um, not that the whole world needs to revolve around them. Uh, that's That can also feel weird. But uh, it's just – it's not about my characters and whether I th- <laughs> make them cool or, like, awesome or whatever. That that's a, it feels like a rookie mistake. It, 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 it reminds me of, like, War Inspector's – thought process when it comes to like talking about like the original Deus Ex and being like yeah the, when when a cool thing's about to happen the player does it the NPCs are there to watch the player do cool things and like yeah like it, it's especially because the way this is set up he's not even like the players did anything to lead to this this is just sort of like surprise someone shows up yeah Absolutely. And in fact, we, we've recorded an episode of the season we're on, Arabella, recently, where I feel like uh, any other <laughs> uh, uh, DM would have called in an NPC to help. And my, I just I just don't. I just won't. <laughs> I, I need them to have their, their consequences. I need their actions to drive the... <laughs> m- maybe I'm, a, I'm an extremist about this in, in uh, retrospect. Maybe I should do this more often. Anyway, this is a DMing philosophy conversation more than a review now. Right. Um, th- the next section after you get saved uh, is you go to the Rock of Brawl, which is the iconic you know, location from Spelljammer where everyone's kind of having their their downtime and talking. You meet a GIF who's going to be like a main character for this whole story. He has a parrot. That's pretty cool. Yep. Uh, I don't know if we need to linger too much on this. There's a little bit of a struggle over a boat. Uh, and then cause, Because actually uh, eventually it becomes clear you're not going to have one iconic ship there are a number of ships that are going to come in and out of your grasp over this adventure Mm -hmm. and eventually the book stops trying to even dictate which one you're on um it just says like whatever your ship you're on go to the next location because you could just you can be on the pirate ship you can be on the the ship from this gif you can be on any number of ships Mm -hmm. uh by the end of this thing yeah um I, i i do like I do like some of the names I have flo- th- throwing around here. The 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 yeah the ship that the gift has is the, the called the Second Wind, which you know fine. Mm-hmm. That's that's all well and good. Um, there's a couple of other. <laughs> yeah, I could see the the jolly boats call out there. Yeah, like all that's well. I think all that's well and good, but this is all just like means of introducing kind of the next NPCs get you onto the next vessel and then move on into the next encounter effectively. Yeah, this is the kind of di- downtime episode you assume the players will shop mm-hmm. and then get uh, have some kind of uh, f- comedy thing where th- for 30 minutes they increasingly cause calamity and then get chased around by the guards because that's how players always act. Yep. Uh, and none of that's written out here. <laughs> you, you just There should be a section that's like, insert hijinks here. Yes. Uh, um, <laughs> these are the types of merchants. These are, the, these are the things they have they don't have. If a player tries to buy this type of item, the shop doesn't have it, no matter how many times they roll persuasion to get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so once you leave, you, there's another combat encounter by the, uh, this Rhaegar, or Rhaegar uh, who attacks you for kind of uh, not really important reasons. <laughs> I think they're mad at the person you're with. Mm-hmm. Um, but this, the, the important thing to me is how this ends, which I, was the part where I was like, are you fucking kidding me? Mm-hmm. Um, if, if you defeat the enemy, their ship sends out a signal that disables your uh, thing. And if you lose, your ship gets disabled. So no matter what happens, your ship gets disabled. And at this, I was like, so basically you should just – you should bomb your own ship <laughs> to get through this fight. I don't understand. I mean I do understand just because they want you to be able to continue no matter what. But also because this person is essentially plot irrelevant – <laughs> um, they like this is not a story about the Rhaegar. It's not a story about like a rivalry. Uh, this whole section re- I found really astonishing, and it felt like they were just like we need to throw a Rhaegar in here to just show that they're around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and like it's, I look, I, I even this like the little like thing they have you read 
when this when your ship is disabled, it's just like you've won a victory, but at what cost? It's like okay. <laughs> Yeah, the co- the cost that you arbitrarily decided. Also, there's a third option, I guess, which is if you kill the Rygar's ship because it's a living ship, the aesthetic. Uh, but but <laughs> then the Rygar takes your ship and jettisons you into space. Mm-hmm. So you, no matter what, you're ending this floating in space. Whether you have a ship, you have their ship, they have your ship. <laughs> there just isn't any uh, other outcome. Mm-hmm. Um, frustrating. Yeah, and and I I do even like how the next section it's like if the if the ship is intact and the spell Jemingham is functional, where I'm just like, oh, oh, okay. So. Yeah. I get I get it. They want you to have uh, a big encounter to show off one of the iconic species and then to move into a, a low-stakes, self-contained thing. Because mm-hmm. the whole next chapter is devoted to this this wizard and her little tower. Topola is her name, mm-hmm. um, which I believe... <sighs> No, I was going to say that's a Final Fantasy character, I want to say, from 4. Ooh. That's... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's even a reference. Uh, it just reminded me <laughs> of that. But um, this whole thing is essentially uh, an opportunity for you to put on a very silly voice for this wizard. It's like a fun social encounter, I think. And then you have to fight a boss to get an item. It's a it's a classic uh, bring me a, a bear ass and I'll give you the, the key. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... Do, 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 do. Yep. Um, just double checking to see anything there. I do love the art they have for Topola, though. I think that the the art show depicting her with a bunch of birds is very good. But I have mm. definitely have already seen people talk about this character and the voice they will use uh, for her. <laughs> and it's it's as yeah. you it's as you allude. Just this is the yeah. This is like the little like reprieve after the big threat moment. So it's. Again, it's very. I'm trying to think about it. it's. It's very cinematic, I guess, in its pacing in that respect. Um, yeah, it reminds me of the that part in the Dark Crystal where they go to the place with the the lady with the um, orrery. It's like it's yeah, it's, it's the witch who gives you uh, the important item on your quest. A lot of <laughs> fantasy stories have this exact beat. Uh, and she's like, oh, defeat the monster, and that will give you the item. And then you do that. <laughs> it's the only, t- really, the wrinkle is that you can bring her with you, um, and that kind of pays off in the next section. <laughs> but I don't know why you wouldn't. Because mm-hmm. it acts like, yeah, I think it says, like, if you say no, she looks sad, but it's like, okay, whatever. <laughs> and then it's like, I, I don't know. I guess there, you have to fill in some of that yourself, because it turns out uh, in the next section you meet her ex, Right. Uh, I don't know if you want to talk about that. No, I, I, yeah, you're talking about the uh, uh, Grimzod, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the best name for a zombie, Grimzod Gargan Hale. Um, honestly, the most anime character, he is wearing that uh, Tokyo Ghoul mask, and he has uh, a severed hand, which is uh, sentient and goes on a little adventure. Uh, honestly, it's a pretty cool character. Mm-hmm. And, like, yeah, it's a big missed opportunity if you don't have Topolo along for the whole thing there. It also leads to, yeah, good gosh, I just came across the art for Grimzod. That's a great look there. <laughs> it's a great. It's it's a very, it's like the hot topic ready. Mm-hmm. Uh, like if, if that anime takes off, you know he's going to be iconic. Um, but, yeah, once you get the item from Topola, you, uh, you you find some pirates. And this is a section where you get the option to join the pirates. There's, like, a little b- box for here are the rules for pirates. Feel free to add your own um, because they are not just pirates. They're vampires. They're vampires. Pirates. So, yeah, so I, I just like, like, the pirate code, Article 1, don't eat each other. Article 2, no hymns. Yeah, it's it's very funny. It's kind of slapstick. Uh, their ship's called the Last Breath, mm-hmm. which is uh, fun. And then yeah, the the combat encounter is that they are tired of getting their asses kicked, and there's a mutiny, and then you have to fight. But whether you win or lose, it doesn't matter because uh, you can have their ship, you can have your ship, uh, you can contrive another ship to come along. Mm-hmm. It's it's really it's it's kind of a wacky uh, 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 detour before you go back to fight these fucking evil elves That's- that you may have forgot about were the premise of this <laughs> adventure. Yep. Uh, I, the, the, the chapter ends with, look, a princess. 
<laughs> and yep, because the reason that this all happened is that they have a princess prisoner who is the twin of the elf who bombed your planet with the seeds that are eating it. I don't know if this hasn't been revealed necessarily to the players that like what happened at the beginning was that the ship shot these seeds, the seeds eat your planet and then send the energy back to the dying star that sustains the elf home world. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only way to save your planet because the seeds are essentially invincible is to blow up their sun, which is kind of intense. That's a high stakes plot. Either you kill all of them or they kill all of you. Not really any middle ground. There's no uh, negotiating out of this one. Yeah, you, you can't. You can't. You can't talk to the one person and choose the right dialogue options to get them to retreat and end the uh, the game that way. This isn't Fallout New Vegas or something. <laughs> Yeah, can I roll persuasion to get the elves to chill out? <laughs> can, can we can we can, can we get like some spa- can we get like some space cocaine and just kind of like chill out together? Well, you can't do that. <laughs> yeah, but I think I already spoiled that this elf princess who ostensibly is trying to help you take her her evil brother down is essentially just as evil and completely interchangeable. Uh, they don't really have that much personality. If anything, she is there as a tool to develop the uh, GIF that you were friends with mm-hmm. because uh, he has like this bad history with the elves. And there's this whole section actually uh, called Old Wounds in the book where you can talk about this backstory with him and be like, <laughs> the, the subsection's called What's Wrong, Big Guy? Yep. I love that. I, I, I saw that. And I like the fact how even this has a situation where you can – mess up with um cheering up uh the gif and it has a detailed thing about what happens if you fail then like they he sulks in this cabin where he emerges 1d8 hours later <laughs> sure yeah. it's 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 funny it's hard to sc- like script ca- encounters like this you don't know what the players are going to do what if one of them is a you know, a professional comedian who's like really funny <laughs> or what if one of them is just like a psycho evil monster? What if- you can't really c- control for all the factors that'll go into this, but I admire them trying. So what if, what if one of your player characters says, I want to be a space clown. It's just like, that's not a player. I'm going to play a space clown. <laughs> <laughs> Say, uh, but yeah. So at, at this, you eventually use the item Topola gave you to go to what's called Doom Space, which is just the next level. Not really super important to break all this down, mm-hmm. but this does end with my other uh, least favorite cliffhanger, which is before Crux can formally introduce Warwick to the group, two bullets eru- erupt from the ground in the character's mist. Uh, that section is <laughs> literally says "bullet time," which is fun. And then next chapter. Uh, no bullet encounter. <laughs> it just it, it, this uh, the actual system part is uh, talking about like oh here's a map and stuff. But when you actually go to chapter eight, arena of blood, it says the two bullets that appeared at the end of the previous session can be fought, or the characters can retreat to the safety of their ship, which just feels like a cop out. There's a part in the Stephen King story Misery mm. where the villain talks about how as a child she used to go see these serials. So this is like in the 50s and every every th- one would end with like a big cliffhanger and then the next one it wouldn't be resolved. Right. And she like the guy he goes in a he's in a car and he goes off a cliff and then the next episode starts with him having jumped out of the car before it went off the cliff and she gets so mad about this. She like breaks the, this guy's ankles with a fucking hammer. <laughs> Yeah, and like all, all I can think about is fucking misery and uh, Annie Bates just, or is it Annie Wilkes? Uh, Bates is the actress who won an Oscar for the role. Um, I, I do love the just f- going ape shit on this fucking guy. Yeah, I, especially when you're talking about the bullet time section, the fact that there's a thing that the the GM is expected to read explicitly, and then right afterwards it says, "Here ends chapter seven. and then. Yeah, just like next as you start. So, anyways, you're off on you're off on your ship again. That was a, oh, that was a, that was a close call there. We almost got into trouble back there, but that was some quick thinking, just running away. I guess it's called bullet time because they dodged it by bending backwards. God um, damn it! That is shit. That's, you got them bullets. Bu- Bullets aren't even like an iconic spell jammer like thing. It's not like a. It's not climactic. I don't know. I. Yep. I don't like it. Yeah. Like, like I said at the beginning, not trying to be mean. It just doesn't feel appropriate. Right. 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 Um, especially like to yeah to end, to end a chapter episode session with for sure. Um, 
let's see here. Then we go, yep, and now we're just next stuff, learning about coalitions. We got bases and stuff like that to contend with. Um, yeah, basically, the, there's the next major NPC you got to deal with is Vokath, who is a Mercane, the blue giants who love to trade. Not going to unpack that here, but the whole thing is like, fight in his arena and it'll help you. Uh, but spoiler alert, it doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> you have to fight through all these locations and then the bad guys just show up anyway. I honestly feel like you can skip a lot of this. It feels like uh, kind of... Uh, combat filler it's like uh we're gonna sit down for three hours next sunday and we're gonna fight uh, a braxit a brogue a brown scaver a gray scaver and a megapede and then we're gonna go get pizza mm -hmm. <laughs> like it doesn't it's not really role play that heavy no no um because yeah at the at the basically at the end of this whole section this arena i mean arenas are a classic way to stretch like J every jrpg has a part where you have to, to go to an arena and fight a bunch of guys mm -hmm. Um, the, the villain shows up on his dragon and this is like the kind of the final boss preview. You could fight him if you want, but it doesn't really matter. Ooh, that's a, that's a theme, isn't it? Right. Uh, it tells you like, if you defeat his dragon, he summons a new one. <laughs> if you defeat him, it turns out it's a clone. It's like, suck me off. I, 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 um, I would almost like this. Like you defeat the dragon and you, a D6 more dragons show up. <laughs> <laughs> It, it really is kind of lame. Um, the, the important thing is that the sister gives you her ring before uh, getting taken back to their home planet. The brother basically kidnaps her mm -hmm. uh, to do a, a, a Jupiter ascending situation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen that film, but he needs to have a big ceremony that you can uh, wreck later. Uh, and he needs a sister. But the ring is a MacGuffin. She gives that to you before being taken back. And uh, I guess if you don't know she's evil, you're like, oh, no, we have to save the princess. Mm -hmm. um, <sighs> yep. We can skip all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, but then we go into the – then we have factions to deal with and, coal, and yes. forging – forming coalitions. So now we're in the uh, the the – it's like, oh, speaking of New Vegas, here's some coalitions to possibly deal with. I mean, this so this part I think had a ton of potential. Mm -hmm. It's almost like a mini game. There's a part here where it says, um, the following is an example of forming a coalition rules in play, which implies like, oh, this is a separate rule set just for this encounter where you're like doing social stuff that D&D &D, like, doesn't have uh, existing systems for. In practice – spoilers none of this matters mm -hmm. uh because no matter what you do in the next section you get beat up and taken prisoner it doesn't matter if you have a cool coalition of uh, awesome guys who rock or if you piss them all off and you know poop yourself in front of them and they'll hate you uh it's simply it, it is nothing this reminds uh, me like, this reminds me of the dragon heist um adventure because it's like you have chapter two of that, which is your 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 party's given this, you know, derelict, you know, uh, rundown tavern that you spend months effectively in the universe building up, and then all of a sudden, fireball blows up out ne next door, and your party's just expected to go investigate it and have concern about their neighbors, irrespective of what the setup is. And there's a lot of like, a lot of things you can do, but it all leads to one point, and. Especially because I really like the prompts they have for how the attitude adjustments work. And I'm like, this is one of those things I would just rip out of this and just use as its own rule set in a, another sort of like campaign, you know? Yeah, we've done we've done factions in a couple seasons now. Yep. In one way, it's kind of like the season four where there was the different um, companies in the Crown Corporation and you kind of had to pick which ones to align with to take down the other ones. But that was like a whole campaign that, like ha that basically was in the background of the entire campaign. Um, another one is the the way we did it in season five, the, the Markov season we've discussed so much, which is like at the end, we had to assemble a coalition to fight the final boss, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and that there was a couple of last minute choices basically it was like oh when the bad guys attacked it was like who do you run to save right now and uh the people they picked to, to rush to were their best allies and the people they did not uh were were fucking pissed honestly mm -hmm. that was that was kind of a controversial point where they're like why are these people so mad and it's like uh because you didn't prioritize them when they were being attacked like yep. <laughs> any any other things aside that's gonna make someone mad at you mm -hmm. yeah um, um and, and like yeah like you said it's it's a 
it's a missed opportunity because there's all this stuff about this setup, but the payoff is it's, it's a single track. There's just you know. There's, yeah, the way the way I, the payoff in season four was completely organic. It literally just steered like what everyone is up to. That that was really hard to recreate. You can't really put that in a book because it's every granular decision. Five was just like who is there at the final battle, uh, and then I actually assigned people numbers and would roll to see if they get like killed mm. by the bad guy. And that that was like uh, I think a much more replicable situation. But in here. What happens first? They do this weird cliffhanger where someone with a red dragon shows up, and they kind of try to bait you into fighting it. They're like, "Ah, oh, I'm gonna kill you all," and then it says like, "If uh, you don't fight," she's like, "I'm just getting," and it gives you an item and leaves. <laughs> Which it seems like that's just that's just a fucking um, mouse trap to try to see if your players will put their dick in it because <laughs> um, it's a red dragon, uh, so it's not a good idea to fight it. I don't know why that's there. No, I I don't know why either, and it's just. Good gosh, Slender just clapped during that whole bit there. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, good gosh. And then, yeah, now you're in Z- uh, Zari- Zarexi space. Good gosh, these days. Yep, this Yeah, this is the elf home world. There's a big fight. Uh, like I said, we can skip a lot of this because it doesn't really matter. Uh, you either, like, fight and then uh, get, get there or you lose and then they bring you there. <laughs> it doesn't. And either way, you end up at the big ceremony, which you, uh, they're like, if anybody has any reason why I should not become the emperor and destroy your home world, speak now or forever hold your peace. And then you say, I object. <laughs> um, and then there's a big fight. And... Uh, it tries to. It, there's kind of this like this idea that you would side with one or the other. I'm trying to find the little box where it says like um, loyalty to one. Yeah, loyalty to Zadala or Zealoth. Mm-hmm. And it's like I don't know anything about the one guy, and he's actively trying to blow up my planet. Why would I be loyal to him? I don't know. This doesn't make any sense as a, a dilemma mm-hmm. essentially. But uh, you get uh, confronted by trial by combat. They bring out the Zodar, who is not foreshadowed in any way. Uh, I know about Zodars, obviously, but uh, if you didn't, I imagine that would be confusing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's essentially the final boss fight. I guess you could fight the the, el- the any remaining elves on your way to the uh, the portal because the way this ends is like there's a portal to the star, and if you throw the MacGuffin ring into the portal, it blows up their star, re- and your home is safe. And then the alternative is don't do that, and your home explodes. Yep. It, it, it also in, in spoilers, if you defeat the Zodar in the throw, it just regains a hit point so it can tell you it's one message, you know, just like it, it's one of the things where like the like you alluded to, like the fight happens, but whether you win or lose the fight, you still have the final plot point to go through. And it's just, well, this is the only choice that basically matters at the end of the campaign, more or less. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's there's a couple different ways to do good endings and bad endings in video games. Uh, sometimes it's the choices you make along the way. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a, at the end of a Deus Ex Human Revolution, there are three buttons to trigger a final cutscene, and you just push whichever cutscene you want to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's that's this style. Um, yeah. The Zodar thing is – because they can only speak three times in their lives, mm-hmm. and they are presumably – motivated by something and that's such a mystery that's the thing i had in the background of my zodar was like what are they up to what are they trying to accomplish and the the heroes never found out and they're still out there Mm -hmm. uh but here it's like your your mission was to lose a fight and then say you blow up the star and then heal everyone and then die and it's like you could have just taken the ring and thrown it in the thing my dude Mm -hmm. like genuinely what is what is your motivation and why I don't yeah, like like it, you know, this reminds me of like the end of Fallout Three. It's like you know, one of your companions could just walk into the thing. They're immune. They 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 can't be harmed by radiation. But no no no, a character has to go in there and die. So <laughs> yeah, just same. St- this is your this is your destiny. Uh, your your partner says. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when the CDC released the latest, latest COVID uh, uh, memo or something, someone posted uh, that picture, <laughs> which is like, it is your destiny. I can't help you. <laughs> the CDC says. Oh, no. But like, yeah. Um, Saviors of the multiverse. I just like the fact that um, 
it's just like, yeah, conclusion. Uh, if it's spared, if the if, if Xarxas is spared, your world's on the brink of annihilation and, you know, go back to your home world and see it blow up. Or if it's destroyed, then, yay, you're the savior of the multiverse. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so uh, as as an ending, it's like the, these evil elves uh, are are extremely foolish. They just bring these adventurers right up to them in their portal. <laughs> and they have you fight a minion who hasn't been foreshadowed. The minion is secretly on your side and will heal you. Uh, very, it's a very strange confluence of events, and uh, I don't love it. I think uh, one thing is that um, someone must travel into the heart of the star either by ship or via the astral font. Uh, everyone realizes this is a journey from which there's no coming back. So it can be a heroic sacrifice. Um, and, and it says, if no character volunteers for this, Grimzod Garganhail, who is the vampire, does so. Um, and I think that's kind of cool. Um, as far as like, if I'm trying to do a, a compliment sandwich here, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like that, I think the idea of asking your characters to uh, do a heroic sacrifice is not a bad beat and having a cool character willing to step up if they don't mm -hmm. is also, it's, uh, characterization, mm -hmm. which is lacking in a lot of these guys. So yeah, that's really the only positive thing I have to say about the, the finale. Grim, yeah. Grimzod having like a cool moment is just nice just because Grimzod is definitely one of the highlights, I think, of the adventure as a whole, as you alluded to earlier. It's just, you know, and it's, yeah, it, it's unfortunately, I think the byproduct of them having to create something that fits within 64 pages, I think that was like mandated by the design of this package, along with trying to show, do a lot of set pieces to show off a lot of Spelljammer itself. But I'm, Wondering how many people might just look at the adventure and then rip out ideas from it and then run in a very different manner. Um, you know, which is fine mm -hmm. if if that's that is value for the product. So, yeah. um, if if that is the way it works, then honestly, it kind of accomplished its job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think it's one where I would find it hard to run it as written and as structured, um, unless you had a party that was just very much on board with just going with things and not really challenging how the story can go. Um, but yeah. Yeah. I mean the honestly the twist should have been flapjack the flump, right? Yeah. Floats out from behind the throne. I was behind it all. You've been a fool. You played right into my hands. Oh, good gosh. That would um, be amazing. If flat, <laughs> like just fla like, or, or I wanted to inspire the party to actually have one of themselves sacrifice, uh, in order to do the thing at the end, have Flapjack be the one that volunteers. Like, no, no, we can't, we can't let the precious flump go through that. One of us will take it on. I mean, and also the the whole flying your ship into the heart of the sun thing did happen in season five. Uh, no one died, but it was like the ship itself dying was the tragedy because everyone was really attached to it. Yeah. Uh, un unlike in this campaign where you're basically just hitchhiking across the galaxy, <laughs> there's no iconic ship for the party to have. And no opportunity really for the party to make like their own ship in the thing is written. It's like it's assumed that your party's just a bunch of folks from Earth that get pulled up into space to go on wacky adventures. Um, and I think it'd be a very different vibe if you started this campaign with a, a party that's already kind of in space and and such. Honestly, it would make things a lot faster, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, also, I mean, I would make a bunch of changes to it. I would have the Zodar show up much earlier and, like, maybe deliver uh, a line at the beginning, mm. middle, and end. Yes. Uh, that for foreshadow because it can speak three times foreshadow different elements and a hint at a larger agenda um oh, so and then you have to do some stuff but that's my first thought no no i think that's great especially because it plays well into the zodar and if you have the zodar presented like that it does make those beats more meaningful as um and especially just does a good building of that because i think that fact the zodar can only speak three times is I think that's a I think that's a cool design uh design element and having that flaunts that is uh would have been nice. So yeah, like like you alluded to, just a lot of potential that feels like it's not as exploited as hard as it could have been, and a lot of things that do railroading for the sake of just making sure you're hitting all the story beats. And you know, for 
I, I almost like to think of it as like this is almost like a a ride at Disney or Universal type of adventure, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't I don't know that I could do better if I if someone hired me to do one of these paths, I probably would make a bunch of uh, errors and mistakes. So it's, this isn't like a I'm a genius and you're a fool thing. Uh, it's just a real hard. It's a hard assignment. So absolutely. Uh, I'm definitely stealing space clowns. That is, <laughs> that is something that's happening. I guess to, to wrap up as we reach the two hour mark, um, I could talk more, but I feel like people have gotten their contents worth. Um, I think we should make an announcement, which is that uh, next season is going to their sirens. They're coming for me. Can you hear yes, them? That's right. <laughs> They're like, no, don't make this don't announcement. Make it. It's, too, it's too spicy. It's too- <laughs> get, get on the ground. Stop resisting. Um, season 10 of Dice Funk is going to be another space season. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like we've never really done a, a tease this far in advance. It's just the timing is perfect with this release of Spelljammer material. Um, if I was better at this, I would do some kind of partnership with WotC. Uh, I don't know how to make that happen. I am just a humble uh moron so <laughs> i i guess we're going to do an unofficial tie-in with this material uh, there's a couple of reasons one is i think it's a just a clean pattern for us to go to space every five seasons seasons five and ten and then presumably 15 being space feels like a fun uh tradition uh other thing is leon uh as he tweeted so i'm not i'm not breaking any news here leon thomas uh only really wants to be involved in space stuff he's just not a big fan of fantasy Mm -hmm. um so when i pitched a a star trek adjacent adventure uh he got he got interested and excited he tweeted about coming back to the show for i believe only one season uh so it's it's really that uh opportunity that i think will give us some some fresh blood a return of an old face of uh, it's it's good stuff um i don't know how much more i want to say the whole cast isn't finalized mm-hmm. um uh this is partially incompetence on my part <laughs> and partially just the fact that scheduling D D is hard yes uh, i'm trying to get people together but everyone's schedules are you know difficult People are moving. There's a pandemic. <laughs> it's a lot. It is a lot. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, I, I saw the reaction to Leon's announcement. And yeah, that's it's really exciting to see Leon uh, be back. Um, the only question is, is he, what is he going to play as? We don't know yet. I don't think we know that. But is he going to be? A- I've heard his pitch and I, I don't want to say any more. Uh, I will say, though. Uh, I think Leon is going to go sicko mode on us. I don't think he's going to play uh, a normal guy going on a normal adventure. I think he is going to uh, fully uh, Violet Skittles unicorn us. Well, you know, it's 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 only appropriate. So we will we will see how that plays out when we get there. But we still got like what another at least what sixteen episodes to go in this season before we get there so we've got a few months on the burner for that yeah the, the the number of episodes we've recorded and released are quite different i'm looking at my desktop i have episode 25 open i don't think that's what's uh out there so no. um yeah they're working on different time scales but um i there's some natural questions people might have about the upcoming season um the only ones i'm prepared to answer are yes it's in the same universe uh, yes, I know when it takes place, but no, I will not say. <laughs> I feel like it will become fairly obvious, but also I want it to be standalone. So I don't want to get bogged down in like trying to clarify the timeline in case someone's just like Googled Spelljammer podcast or something and just, you know, finds it um, and they don't have to worry about all the other stuff. But like, yeah, it's it's going to be a continuation of uh, the universe like every season. It's not like a separate thing but i know you're gonna say like wait wasn't the whole world destroyed how is there space or whatever and it's like either you'll figure it out or you won't either way uh i don't think it's gonna have that much impact like you know leon is gonna go back and listen to season six and try to figure out how it fits together he's gonna be too busy uh you know kicking over trash cans and setting small fires (laughs) as is appropriate for him so but yeah uh very cool announcement there, and yeah, it was definitely fun reviewing over all this stuff with you, Austin. So thanks for uh, thanks for the idea and inviting me on board for this. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. We I mean we could have done a lot more. We skimmed and skipped a lot. Mm-hmm. So um, 
I don't know if there's anything else we should announce. I want to say that uh, law, uh, current listeners, if you're up, up to date with the show, you'll know that you know Sophie is going through a lot of stuff in her personal life, um, leaving the country, per, you know, stuff, and I, it's not really my place to speak on. Um, so that they have been scarce recently, and that is shaking up the main show in some ways. And I have plans, and I want you to trust me. <laughs> I say making direct eye contact with you. Um, it's not. I don't know if it's going to be obvious what's going on at first, but it will become obvious, and I hope you will enjoy the adventure we're going on because it is going to be unique. I, th- I think you're going to be like, well, no other podcast <laughs> would do this. <laughs> so that's, that's what I'll say about Arabella. We're, we're reaching, I have a, you know, a couple more arcs we're getting it's going to be the normal length of the season and then the space time that's right 